Welcome to Westview's Worship Online. We're so glad that you're here to join us this morning. And this morning, we would also like to wish you a happy Father's Day. Whether you're a father, a stepfather, an uncle, a grandpa, or a significant role model, we want to honor you and wish you a happy Father's Day this morning. This morning, as we start our worship, we'd like to let you know some of the things that are happening with our Westview community. One of those things is Alpha Online. Alpha started last week and we had a great group starting together, but we do still have a little bit of room. So if you are interested, we'd love to have you join us on Sundays at seven. Please be in touch with Anne and let her know that you're interested. We also have life groups online still meeting. So be in touch with me, Pastor Tina, and I'll get you in touch with somebody to join a group on the phone or online. Both options are available. We still also have virtual coffee available on Sundays at 11. So we'd love to have you join us. You should have received an email with a link. And if you're part of our online community and you did not get that link and you'd like to meet some new people, uh, contact us through Facebook or YouTube and we'll get you in touch with this group. This morning, we would like to worship together, beginning with a reading from Psalm chapter 146, verses seven through 10, which read, the Lord frees the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts the burdens of those bent beneath their loads. And the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects the foreigners among us and he cares for the orphans and widows. But he frustrates the plans of the wicked. The Lord will reign forever. O Jerusalem, your God is king in every generation. Praise the Lord. Now let us praise together this morning.
Have you ever played a memory game? There's a game I used to like playing when I was a kid. My mom would lead it with us at birthday parties. What she would do is she would take a baking pan and she'd cover it with all kinds of tiny little objects and then she would cover it up with a towel. The point of the game was that we had to memorize all the objects on the tray. So we had exactly one minute to look at everything on the tray. I'll give you a look so you can see what's on here. If you'd like to play, you can pause it and take a look at home too. When that minute was up, she would cover it up again and we would have to go find a paper and a pen and write down as many of those objects as we could remember. I have to admit, it was kind of a hard thing to do to remember all those objects. And sometimes I'd get really frustrated and wish that I could have just one more look. There's actually a part in the Bible that talks about sometimes how we forget what we have just seen or what we have just read in the Bible. In James chapter 1 verses 22 to 23 it says, Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. For the game I played, I often felt like I quickly forgot all the items on the tray and I was frustrated when I couldn't write them all down on that paper and then disappointed when I lost. It actually encouraged me to want to try harder to play better at this game. So I practiced with my siblings and got better at it because we still only had that one time, a single minute, that we could look at what was on the tray and we had to memorize it. So for this game, we had one opportunity. But when it comes to remembering what God has told us in the Bible, we can look at it anytime, but it's always better if we remember exactly what God has told us in the Bible. So take the time, read what God has told you, because in any moment, you'll be prepared to remember what God would want you to do.
Hi, my name is May Sutter, and I am pleased to be able to read the scripture for everyone this morning. And it is found in James 1, 19 to 27. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at their face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Those who consider themselves religious and yet do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and their religion is worthless. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And we know God will bless the reading of his word. Hello everyone and welcome back to worship together again. It's really good to have you, whether you are a long-time Westview participant or whether you are maybe just checking out Westview or checking out Faith for the first time, I'm really glad that you're here. Last Sunday, we started looking at a book in the Bible called James, which is a letter written by a man named James who was pastor of a, of a church, writing to the people of his church who had been scattered around that uh, part of the world because of persecution. He wanted to care for them, he wanted to guide them, while they were experiencing a lot of hardship and pain, separated from their close friends, separated from their church family, and still struggling to live out their faith, even though there were new pressures and new cultures that they were experiencing. We are separated from one another right now, and it can be hard to live out your faith. James writes a really practical letter telling us ways that we can re-examine our faith to make sure that it's just bigger than something that we've made up ourselves. He actually wants us to have a baggy faith, a faith that we can grow into, kind of like when we were kids and had to buy clothes that were two sizes bigger so there was room to grow. He wants us to have a faith that reflects the greatness of the God that we love. Because if our faith fits us perfectly, it probably isn't about God, it's probably just my opinions and my ideas. We want a baggy faith. And as we look at the passage in front of us today from James chapter 1, 19 to 27, we see him describing a baggy faith that has to do with, are you really understanding? He uh, describes a mirror in the midst of this passage, and we'll get to that in a minute. But the question is, what do you do with a mirror? When you stand in front of a mirror, what's the purpose? Are you standing there to admire yourself? Are you standing there to examine yourself and uh, make the necessary adjustments, whether it's combing your hair, fixing your makeup? What do you do in front of a mirror? James wants us to understand many different things so that we can live out a practical faith. He starts off by giving us some advice to be slow, or sorry, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Uh, and we could skim over those words and assume that, uh, that he's saying something that he isn't really. We might assume, for instance, that he's saying, don't get angry. Uh, it's not quite that simple. You see, he's not saying here that we should just be nice people because our baggy faith is bigger than nice. 
it's bigger than nice because sometimes hard truth has to be spoken but in order to understand what truth has to be spoken we have to listen first now I said our faith is bigger than nice when you look in the pages of Scripture when we look at respected church leaders when we even look at the life of Jesus our Savior we see them getting angry they get angry at times when they have to challenge somebody when uh, truth is being compromised when they are standing in the way of somebody else's faith there is a time to be angry but when you look at each of these people whether it's Jesus John the Baptist Peter Paul these are not angry people but they are people who had listened well to what was going on and when the moment was necessary they spoke hard truths everything from Jesus calling out Pharisees and Sadducees as hypocrites who said one thing but did another to Peter telling a new convert to Christianity that he hoped his money would die with him because he had thought he could pay to receive the gift of doing miracles uh, or the really harsh words of the Apostle Paul in the book of Galatians where he is challenging the congregation in that that area to uh, remember their original faith false teachers had come in and dragged them away from grace and instead were telling them that they needed to do more in order to be accepted by God and, and Paul actually says I wish those false teachers would go all the way and castrate themselves these are not nice words but they were necessary words because they understood what was going on and the risks that were uh, what was at risk in the life of the church but because we need to know when it's time to speak hard truth we have to listen and that's the first thing and that's the unnatural thing we aren't naturally good listeners most of us want people to hear us and so we're quick to speak and slow to listen the book of Proverbs has a lot to say about how we use our mouths and how we use our ears and in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 we are told that fools delight in airing their own opinions but they want nothing to do with understanding we have all been guilty of that of trying to push our words forward to be heard and understood but never really stopping to hear what the other person has to say if we're going to understand when truth even hard truth has to be spoken first we need to listen well to the people around us so that we know what's actually going on our faith is bigger than nice. Our faith is also better than good. Uh, those two words sometimes are synonymous, but, uh, but nice is how we treat people. Good can just be about what is inside of me. And we are called to be good, but we can never do that on our own. Our, at the core of our faith is the fact that Jesus came to fulfill all the requirements of the law that we can never could never fulfill on our own because of Jesus we can receive his perfection his goodness that we could never have had otherwise James talks about the perfect law that brings freedom and that we need to look intently into it uh, and he's talking about all of God's Word uh, not just the rules and the laws at the beginning but when he talks about that perfect law that brings freedom he is pointing us towards Jesus who is perfect who came to fulfill the law on our behalf we need all of it we need to understand God's intention for our lives by looking at those laws that we could never keep but we also need to look at God's grace through Jesus how his plan his word was made perfect by Jesus actions on our behalf we look intently into it because we need to understand the story of what God has been doing all along what God wants for us we need to understand how God wants us to live but it's not just research and it's better than good because you and I could could think that well if I just make this a self-improvement project then all is well I'll just read the Bible do what it says 
and I'm good with God. We can't just be good. And here there's a real distinction. If you're listening to this and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have his goodness. And it doesn't mean that you don't need to pay attention to what the Bible says. You do, but you do it as a response of love. We have the rest of our lives when we are in Jesus Christ. We have the rest of our lives to be able to work out what God wants us to do, how he wants us to live, because we will never be cast from his presence. But if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, then you're in a very different situation. You could look at the Bible and see all of the rules that it asks of you. And if you start trying to do those, first of all, you will be frustrated. Secondly, you will never actually accomplish it. And third, it will not give you a relationship with God. We are told in Scripture that we have to keep all of the laws, otherwise we have broken all of the laws. And when we break the law, we are separated from God. If you have not put your faith in Jesus Christ, reading the Bible and doing what it says, following the rules, will accomplish nothing more than making you a good person and a frustrated person. But when we really look intently into the perfect law that gives freedom, we find Jesus. We find what he has done for us. And we see the invitation to trust him. That's better than good. Because it gives us freedom, liberty. We don't have to do it on our own. We are never alone again. We have a person who loves us, who laid down his life for us, and who also does have a plan of action for us, but that plan of action is not something that we're being uh, scrutinized on to see whether we will make it into heaven or not. When we trust in Jesus, we are with him forever. And we intently look into God's word every day trying to follow what he asks because we love him because we want to honor him. This is better than good because uh, it's not just research, it's a relationship. And we look intently into it, not just once, but over and over again, because we want to understand who God is and how he wants us to live. So it's an act of faith. And James stresses this, that our faith is not just ideas, it's not just words on a page. Our faith is meant to be lived out in practical actions that people can see. But our faith is bolder than just busy. We aren't just supposed to keep ourselves busy every hour, every day, doing good things. What we are called to do is to be intentional about the good that God has called us to do. It's interesting that at the end of this passage, James tells us to care for the orphans and the widows. Now those were the most fringe group of people in that society. They were people that others neglected. Um, they were nobody's concern. And it was easy to forget about them. James is reminding the Christians that we don't just look after ourselves, we don't just look after our own, we look intentionally for those who have been lost and forgotten by the world, and we care for them. And we engage in the world to do that. We have to actually look around and see what the needs of the world are. Where are the people who are broken and forgotten? Where are they? And that means that we have to be intentionally engaging in the world around us but engaging in a way that doesn't get us sucked back into the ways of the world. When we get busy, we forget to be intentional. And when we get busy, we can also go on autopilot and very easily get sucked back into the mindset that the world has adopted for itself. We have the mind of Christ, and as we walk in the world, as we look for the needs of the world, as we care for the forgotten of the world, 
we are still very intentionally remembering that we live for Jesus Christ, that we do things for him in his power. That's bolder than just being busy. And it requires us to go back to the second point, which is to look intently into God's word. You know, the work that we're called to do, and we are called to work, to act, to do, but it requires us to stop and look again in God's word, to remember who God is, to remember who we are in God's presence, to remember why we do what we do. That's better than busy. That's part of a baggy faith because it's not natural. It's not natural for us to listen. It's not natural for us to dig into something in order to be stretched in a new direction, to do things we wouldn't naturally. And it's not natural for us to keep asking what God wants us to do as opposed to what I want to do. We are invited into a baggy faith. And as we do that, we lean on Jesus Christ who has brought us perfection. I asked you earlier what you do when you look in a mirror. Well, we look ideally to understand yeah, to admire ourselves, to understand the goodness that God has given us, that he, he created us to be wonderful. We also look to see what's gone wrong and what we need to fix. And we do the same thing as we live out our baggy faith in the world. We, we look and we listen at those around us to see where maybe truth needs to be spoken. We look and we listen to the Word of God to see how we are to be stretched and changed. And we look and we listen as we walk through the world because we want to love and care for this world intentionally without becoming like the world. So stay tuned. And as you do this, stay safe. And remember to stay the course because life, this life in Jesus Christ is worth it.
May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts toward him to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees, and laws he gave our ancestors so that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is no other. Amen.